Have you ever wondered about the origin of our notion of right and wrong? The concept of the law written in the heart, mentioned in the scriptures, proposes that we are all born with an innate understanding of good and evil, guided by an internal moral conscience. C.S. Lewis, in Mere Christianity, refers to this as the law of universal morality, an internal compass that guides us in distinguishing between right and wrong. In this excerpt that I will present, Lewis explores how this moral perception, present in each of us, reflects the existence of a universal truth about morality, regardless of our religious beliefs. Follow the discussion that follows to understand how this internal law guides us towards the truth. Everyone has seen people arguing. Sometimes the argument sounds funny and sometimes just unpleasant. But however it sounds, I believe we can learn something very important by listening to the kind of things they say. They say things like, how would you feel if someone did the same to you? This place is mine. I got here first. Leave him alone. He's not bothering you. You pushed first. Give me a piece of your orange. I gave you a piece of mine. Come on, you promised. People say things like this every day, both the polite and the rude, and both children and adults. Now, what interests me in comments of this kind is that the person making them is not simply saying that they do not like the other person's behavior. They are appealing to a kind of standard of behavior they expect the other to be aware of. And the other rarely responds with, screw your standard. Almost always, he tries to convince them that what he has been doing does not really infringe upon the standard, or that if it does infringe, there is some special excuse. He argues that there is some special reason in this particular case why the person who sat down first should not occupy the place or that things were quite different when he received the piece of the orange, or that some unforeseen event prevented him from keeping his promise. All of this leads us to believe that both parties had some kind of law or rule of justice, dignified behavior, or morals, or something of the sort about which they really agree. And they have agreed. If they hadn't, they might even fight like animals, but they couldn't argue in the human sense of the word. The purpose of an argument is to show that the other is wrong, but there would be no point in doing so unless you and he had some agreement on what is right and wrong. Just as it makes no sense to say that a soccer player has committed a foul if there wasn't an agreement on the rules of soccer. Now, the law or rule about right and wrong used to be called natural law. Today, when we talk about natural law, we are usually referring to things like gravity, heredity, or the laws of chemistry. However, when the ancient thinkers called the law of right and wrong the natural law, they were actually referring to the law of human nature. The idea was that, just as all bodies are governed by the law of gravity and organisms by biological laws, the creature called human being also had its law, with one major difference. A body cannot choose whether to obey the law of gravity or not, while a person can choose whether or not to obey the law of human nature. This matter can be looked at from another perspective. Any person is subject to different sets of laws, but there is only one law that he has the freedom to disobey. As a body, he is subject to gravity and cannot disobey it. Once suspended in the air, he has no choice but to fall like a stone. As an organism, he is subject to various biological laws which, like the animals, he cannot disobey. That is, he cannot disobey those laws that he shares with other things, but the law that is peculiar to his human nature, the law that he does not share with animals, plants, or inorganic things, is the one he can disobey if he wishes. This law was called the natural law because people believed everyone knew it by nature and did not need to be taught by others. Clearly, they were not saying that it would be impossible to find a peculiar individual out there who did not know it, just as you can find people who are colorblind or who have no talent for music. However, taking the race as a whole, they thought the human idea of dignified behavior was obvious to everyone. I believe they were right. If they were not, then everything we said about the war would have been nonsensical. What sense would it make to say that the enemy is wrong if right is not something real that, deep down, the Nazis knew as well as we did and had a duty to practice? If they had no notion of what we meant by right and wrong, then although we would still have had to fight them, we could no more blame them for it than for the color of their hair. I know that some people consider the natural law or the law of dignified behavior known to all men 
to be baseless because various civilizations and peoples from different times have erected very different moral doctrines. But that is not true. It's correct that there are differences between their moralities, but these have never amounted to a total difference. If one took the trouble to compare the moral teachings of ancient Egyptians, Babylonians, Hindus, Chinese, Greeks, and Romans, they would indeed be struck by the similarities among them and also in relation to our moral teachings. Some of the evidence for this is gathered in an appendix of another one of my books titled The Abolition of Man, but for our current purpose, it suffices to ask the reader just to imagine what a completely different morality would look like. Imagine a country where people were admired for running away from battle, or where a person took pride in having cheated all those who were kind to them. It would be akin to trying to imagine a country where two plus two equals five. There is disagreement about the people to whom you should be altruistic, whether just to your own family or to your fellow countrymen or to everyone. But they have always agreed that you should never put yourself above others, as selfishness has never been something to admire. People differ as to whether you should have one wife or four, but there has always been agreement that you cannot simply have any woman you desire. But the most striking fact is the following. Even if you can find someone who asserts with all certainty that they do not believe there is really such a thing as right and wrong, that very person will appeal to it soon after. They may even break a promise they made to you. But if you try to break yours to them in the blink of an eye, they will be complaining that it's not fair. A nation may say it doesn't care about treaties, but then the next moment it starts to make its case, saying that the particular treaty others want to break was unfair. However, if treaties don't matter, if there is no such thing as right and wrong, in other words, if there is no natural law, the law of human nature, what would be the difference between a fair treaty and an unfair one? Haven't they betrayed themselves, showing that as much as they speak against it, they know the natural law as well as anyone else? It seems, then, that we are forced to accept that there is such a thing as right and wrong. People can often be mistaken about them, just as people sometimes make mistakes in calculations. But this is not merely a matter of taste or opinion, but of arithmetic. Now, if we are agreed on this point, I will move on to my next point, which is as follows. None of us actually observes the natural law. If there is any exception among you, I apologize. It would be better for you to read another book, as nothing I am going to say pertains to you. And now let's return to ordinary human beings. I hope you do not misunderstand what I'm about to say, for I do not wish to preach, and God knows I do not pretend to be better than anyone else. I am merely trying to draw attention to the fact that this year, or this month, or more likely today, we have failed to adopt the kind of behavior we expect from others. We can use any excuse. That time when you were unfair to your children, it was when you were very tired. That somewhat shady deal, that one you've almost forgotten about, came up when you were financially strapped. And what you promised to do for good old so-and-so and never did, well, you would never have promised to do it if you knew how busy you would be from that day forward. And as for your behavior towards your wife or husband or sister or brother, if I knew how annoying they could be, I wouldn't be surprised. And after all, who do I think I am? I am no different, that is, I am not very successful in observing the natural law. And when someone tells me that I am not observing it, an endless list of good excuses immediately comes to mind. The point at this moment is not whether these excuses are good. The fact is that these excuses are further proof of the depth of our belief in the natural law, whether we like it or not. If we didn't believe in dignified behavior, why would we be so concerned about making excuses for not having behaved in a dignified manner? The truth is that we believe in it so strongly we feel the rule of the law pressing upon us so heavily that we can't face the fact that we're breaking it, and consequently, we try to escape responsibility. You end up realizing that it is only for our bad behavior that we give all these explanations, and it's only our bad mood that we justify by tiredness, anxiety, or hunger. Our good mood, on the other hand, we attribute to ourselves. These, then, are the two points I would like to highlight. First, that human beings from all corners of the world have this curious idea that they ought to behave in a certain way and really cannot help doing so. Second, 
that individuals do not actually behave in that way. They know the moral law, but they break it. These two facts are the foundation of all clear thinking about ourselves and the universe we live in. Some objections. If the two points made are our foundation, it is better before we proceed to pause a little and make these foundations solid. Some letters I received show that numerous people find this concept of the law of human nature, or moral law, or yet the rule of decent behavior, difficult to understand. Some people wrote to me saying, for example, could what you call the moral law simply be the herd instinct, and has it not developed in the same way as all our other instincts? At this point, I do not deny that we may have a herd instinct, but that is not what I am referring to when I speak of the moral law. We all know what it's like to have an instinct awakened by maternal love, sexual instinct, or the instinct for food. It means having a strong longing or desire to act in a certain way. Of course, sometimes we feel precisely this kind of desire to help another person, and without a doubt this desire arises from the herd instinct, but feeling the desire to help someone is quite different from feeling that you have the obligation to help her regardless of your will. Suppose you hear a cry for help from a person in danger. You will probably have two desires, the desire to offer help because of your herd instinct, and another to keep out of danger due to the instinct for self-preservation. But you will find within yourself, besides these two impulses, a third thing that tells you that you ought to follow the impulse to help and suppress the impulse to flee. Now this thing that makes you judge between two instincts and decides which of the two should be encouraged cannot itself be either of them. Likewise, you could say that the sheet music telling you that, at a given moment, you should play one note on the piano and not another is equivalent to one of the keyboard's notes. The moral law tells us what note we should play, whereas our instincts are merely keys. Another way to recognize that the moral law is not one of our instincts is as follows. Whenever two instincts are in conflict and there's nothing in a creature's mind beyond that, obviously the stronger of the two will prevail. However, in moments when we are most aware of the moral law, it usually seems to recommend that we choose the weaker of the two impulses. You will likely wish to stay safe more than you want to help a person who is drowning, but the moral law tells you to help them anyway. And certainly, it often tells us to try to make the right impulse stronger than it naturally was, right? That is, we often feel it's our duty to stimulate the herd instinct, awakening our imagination and provoking our compassion, and so on, in order to have the strength to do the right thing. But of course, we are not acting on instinct when we begin to make an instinct stronger than it was. That which tells you, your herd instinct is asleep, wake it up, cannot be the herd instinct itself. The thing that tells you which piano note you should play louder cannot be that note itself. Here goes the third way to recognize it. If the moral law were one of our instincts, we would be able to point to some of the impulses within us that we could always call good, which would always conform to the rule of correct behavior. But we are not, for there is no impulse among ours that the moral law has not at some point told us to suppress and none that it has not told us to encourage. It is a mistake to think that any of our impulses, for example, maternal love or patriotism, are good in others, like sex or the fighting instinct are bad. All we are saying is that the occasions when the fighting instinct or the sexual desire need to be repressed are more frequent than those for restraining maternal love or patriotism. However, there are situations in which it is the duty of a married person to encourage their sexual impulse and of a soldier to stimulate his fighting instinct. And there are also times when a mother's love for her children or an individual's love for their own country must be suppressed. For otherwise, it might lead them to commit injustice to other people's children and other nations. Strictly speaking, there are no good or bad impulses. Back to the piano. It does not have two types of keys, the right and the wrong, i.e. every key is correct at a certain moment and wrong at another. In this sense, the moral law is not a single instinct or set of instincts, but something that produces a kind of tone, the tone we call goodness or right conduct, that directs the instincts. Moreover, this point has huge practical implications. The most dangerous thing you can do is to take an impulse of our own nature and set it as a rule to be followed at all costs, because all of them, without exception, have the power to turn us into demons if we make them our absolute guides. 
You might think that love for humanity in general is free from this danger, but it is not. If you set aside the sense of justice, soon you'll be breaking agreements and forging evidence for the good of humanity and becoming, in the end, a cruel and treacherous person. Others wrote to me saying, Could what you call the moral law be just a social convention, something that has been instilled in us by education? I think there is a misunderstanding here. People who ask this kind of question are usually assuming that if we learn something from our parents and teachers, then it must be a mere human invention. But of course, things are not like that. We all learn multiplication tables at school. A child who had grown up on a deserted island would not know them. But it surely cannot be inferred from this that the multiplication table is a mere human convention, something that humans have invented for themselves and could have made different if they wished. I agree entirely that we learn the rule of decent behavior from parents and teachers and from friends and books, just as we learn all other things. But some of the things we learn are mere conventions that could have been different. We learn to keep to the left side of the road, but the rule could also have been to keep to the right. And others, like mathematics, are real truths. The question is, to which of these classes the law of human nature belongs? There are two reasons for saying that it belongs to the same class as mathematics. The first is that, as I said in the first chapter, although there are differences between the moral ideas of one time or country and those of another, the differences are not really very large, not nearly as large as most people imagine. And you can recognize the same law operating in all. Mere conventions like traffic rules or the kinds of clothes people wear can differ profoundly. The other reason is this. If you consider the differences between the morality of one people and that of another, do you not tend to think that the morality of one is always better or worse than that of another? Could some of the changes not have been for the better? If not, then there could surely be no moral progress. Progress means not just mere change, but change for the better. So if no set of moral ideas was truer or better than another, there would be no sense in preferring civilized morality to savage morality or Christian morality to Nazi morality. Indeed, it is clear that we all believe some moralities to be better than others. We believe that some people who tried to change the moral ideas of their own time were what we call reformers or pioneers, people who understood morality better than their contemporaries. Very well then, the moment you say that one set of moral ideas can be better than another, you are actually measuring both according to a standard, saying that one conforms more closely to that standard than the other. However, the standard that measures two things is different from morality itself. You are, in fact, comparing both to some real morality, admitting that something is a real truth regardless of what people think, and that the ideas of some people come closer to what is really right than others. Or let's put it in these terms. If your moral ideas can be truer and those of the Nazis less so, there must be something, some real morality, according to which they are true. The reason why your idea of New York can be more or less true than mine is that New York is a real place, existing independently of what any of us thinks. If by saying New York, each of us meant merely the city I am imagining in my mind, how could one assume that one of us had truer ideas than the other? In the end, it would not be a matter of true or false. Likewise, if the rule of decent behavior meant simply whatever each nation decided to approve, it would make no sense to say that any nation had ever been more correct than any other in its judgment, just as it would make no sense to say that the world could morally improve or degenerate. I conclude, then, that although the difference between people's ideas about decent behavior often makes them suspect that there is no real natural behavior law, the very issues related to this matter that we are forced to think about prove exactly the opposite. However, let me say one more thing before closing. I have encountered people who exaggerate the differences because they do not distinguish between differences in morality and differences in belief about facts. For example, one person said to me, 300 years ago, witches were being burned in England. Was that the work of what you call the rule of human nature or right conduct? Surely the reason we do not execute witches today is that we do not believe in such things because if we did believe, if we truly thought that there are people out there who have sold their souls to the devil and, in exchange, have received from him supernatural powers and are using these powers to kill their neighbors, or drive them mad, or bring about storms, then surely all of us would agree that, 
if anyone deserves the death penalty, it would be these vile traitors. There is no difference in moral principle here. The difference is simply in how the facts are viewed. Not believing in witches may represent a great advance in human knowledge. When we think they exist, there is no moral advance in not executing them. You would not consider a person more humane for stopping setting mousetraps if it were because she had ceased to believe that there were mice in the house. The Reality of the Law I now return to what I said at the end of the first chapter, namely that there are two strange things about the human race. First, that they are haunted by the idea that there is a kind of behavior they ought to adopt which we might call justice or decency or morality or the natural law. Second, that in fact they do not act in accordance with it. Now you might be wondering why I find this strange, since to you it might seem the most natural thing in the world. You might think I've been particularly hard on the human race. After all, you might say, what I call breaking the law of right and wrong or of nature means merely this, that people are not perfect. And why should I expect anything different? Man, that would be a good answer if what I were trying to do was to figure out the exact amount of blame we deserve for not behaving as we expect others to behave. But that is absolutely not my intention. At this point, I'm not concerned with guilt. I'm just trying to find out the truth. And from that point of view, the very idea of something being imperfect, of not being what it ought to be, has certain implications. If we consider an object like a stone or a tree, it is what it is, and there seems no sense in saying it should be something else. Of course, you can say that a stone does not have the right shape if you want to use it to adorn a garden, or that a tree is not good because it does not provide you with the shade you expected. But all you are saying is that the stone or the tree is not fitting for some particular purpose. You won't blame such objects for this unless you do so in jest. You'll be aware that given the conditions of weather and soil, the tree could not have been different. What we call a bad tree, from our point of view, obeys the laws of its nature just as much as a good tree. Do you see where I'm getting at? What I am trying to say is that what we usually call natural laws, like how the weather conditions worked on the tree, may not be laws in the strict sense of the word, but just a way of speaking. If you say that stones, when dropped, always obey the law of gravity, isn't that the same as saying the law doesn't mean anything more than what stones always do? You don't really think that if you drop the stone, it will suddenly remember that it has orders to fall to the ground, do you? You mean just that it simply falls. In other words, you cannot be sure there is anything beyond the facts themselves. Some law that dictates what should happen, very different from what actually does happen. The laws of nature, when applied to stones or to trees, may not mean anything more than what nature in fact does. But if we take the law of human nature, the law of decent behavior, then things change. This law certainly does not mean what human beings in fact do, because as I said earlier, many of them do not obey this law at all. Indeed, none of them obey it completely. The law of gravity tells you what stones do if you let them fall. But the law of human nature tells you what human beings ought to do and do not. In other words, when dealing with human beings, some other considerations come into play that go far beyond the actual facts. We have, on the one hand, the facts, how people behave, but we also have something else, how they ought to behave. There is no need for there to be anything beyond facts throughout the universe. Electrons and molecules behave in certain ways, which lead to certain outcomes, and the story could end there. But human beings behave in certain ways, and the story does not stop there, because you are aware all the time that they ought to behave differently. Now, this is indeed so typical that we are tempted to make flimsy excuses. For example, we might try to pretend that when we say a person shouldn't be doing what they're doing, it's the same as saying the shape of a stone is unsuitable. That is, what this person is doing is inconvenient for you. But that's simply not true. A person sitting in the best seat on the train because they got there first, and another who took advantage of my distraction to take my luggage and sit down are both equally inconvenient. But I would only complain about the second case not the first. I won't be angry with someone who trips me by accident, except maybe for a moment before I regain my composure. But I will be angry with someone who tries to trip me, even if they don't succeed. Even though the first one has hurt me and the second has not. Sometimes the behavior I call bad is not at all inconvenient for me. In fact, quite the opposite. 
In a war, both sides might find a traitor from the opposite side very useful. But no matter how much they might use him and pay him, they will refer to him as a human worm. Therefore, you cannot say that what we call decent behavior in others is simply the behavior that seems useful to us, and, as for our own good conduct, it seems obvious to me that it's not just about what brings us advantages. It's about being content with 30 shillings when we could have had three pounds, about doing our homework honestly when it would be easier to copy, about leaving the girl alone when we actually felt like going to bed with her, about going to dangerous places when we could go to much safer ones, about keeping promises we would rather not have made, and about telling the truth even if it makes us look foolish. Some people say that although decent conduct doesn't bring advantage to the individual at a particular moment, it still brings advantage to the human race as a whole, and that consequently, there's no mystery about it. After all, humans have some common sense and recognize that real security or happiness is only possible in a society where everyone plays fair, and that this is because they recognize the attempt to behave decently. Now, it's perfectly true that security and happiness can only come from individuals, classes, and nations that are honest, play fair, and are kind to each other. This is one of the most important truths in the world, but it would be a mistake to take it as an explanation for how we feel about right and wrong. If someone asked, why should I be altruistic? and you answered, because it's good for society, we could then ask, why should I care about what's good for society if it brings me no personal advantage? Then you'd have to say, because you ought to be altruistic, which just brings us back to where we started. You're telling the truth, but you're not getting anywhere. If someone asked what the point of playing ball is, it wouldn't be a good answer to say it's to score goals, because trying to score goals is the game itself not the reason for the game, and you'd only be saying that football is football, which is true but doesn't need to be said. Similarly, if someone asks what the point of behaving decently is, it won't be a good answer to say it's to do good to society, because trying to benefit society, or in other words being altruistic, since society means nothing more than other people, is one of the things that decent behavior consists of. All you're really saying is that decent behavior is decent behavior. You would have said the same thing if you just stated, a human being ought to be altruistic, and stop there. And this is where I stop. People ought to be altruistic, ought to play fair. Not that they are or like being altruistic, but it's what they should be. The moral law or the law of human nature is not just a fact about human behavior, like the law of gravity is or might be just a fact about how heavy objects behave. On the other hand, it is not mere fantasy, for we can't rid ourselves of the idea, and most things we say and think about humans would reduce to nonsense if we did. Nor is it simply a statement about how we would like humanity to behave for our own convenience. For the behavior we call bad or unjust is not exactly the same as the behavior we find convenient. In fact, it might be the opposite. Consequently, this rule of right and wrong, or law of human nature, or whatever you want to call it, must be in one way or another real something that truly exists that isn't invented by us. And yet it is not a fact in the ordinary sense, just as our actual behavior is a fact. It seems we must begin to admit that there is more than one type of reality, that in this particular case there is something far beyond the ordinary facts of human behavior, and yet definitely very real, a real law that none of us made up, but that exerts pressure on us. But I don't believe that's really the whole story, as you will see later on. I mean that, judging from the arguments given so far, there is this possibility. What lies behind the law? Let's summarize what we have seen so far. In the case of stones, trees, and things of that sort, what we call the laws of nature may be nothing more than a way of speaking. When you say that nature is governed by certain laws, it means only that it indeed behaves in certain ways. Such laws may not be something real, that is, they may be nothing more than observed facts. But in the case of humans, we have seen that things do not work that way. The so-called laws of human nature, or of right and wrong, must be something that goes beyond the actual facts of human behavior. In this case, beyond the actual facts, you have something more, a real law that we didn't invent and that we know we have to obey. At this point, 
I'd like to consider what this tells us about the universe we live in. Since people began to think, they have wondered what this universe really is and how it came into being. And very basically, two views have been held. First, there's what we call the materialistic view. People who hold this view think that matter and space just exist and always have. No one knows why. And that matter, by behaving in certain fixed ways, just happened to produce creatures like us, who, by great luck, were able to think. By one chance in a thousand, something collided with our sun and caused it to produce planets. And by another chance in a thousand, all the chemicals necessary for life and the right temperature appeared on one of these planets and thus a portion of the matter on this earth gained life. And then, through a very long series of chances, living creatures developed until they became very much like us. The other view is the religious one. According to it, what lies behind the universe is more like a mind than anything else we know. That is, it's something conscious that has purposes and preferences. According to this view, this being created the universe, partly for purposes we don't know, but partly in any case to produce creatures like him, that is, like him in the sense of having minds. Please don't think that one of these views has been held for a long time and the other gradually took its place. Both views appear wherever there have been thinking men. And more, it's not possible to find out which of these views, in its common sense, is correct from a scientific standpoint. Science works by experiment and observes the behavior of things. Every scientific statement in the long run, no matter how complicated it seems, actually means something like, I pointed the telescope to this or that part of the universe at 2.20 on January 15th and saw this or that, or I placed such material in a beaker and heated it to a certain temperature and this or that happened. Don't think I'm disparaging science. I'm just saying what its job is. And the more scientific a person is, the more, I believe, she would agree with me that this is its role. And it's indeed a quite useful and necessary task. But why things happen and whether there's anything behind what science observes, something of a different kind, those are not scientific questions. If there's something behind, then either it will have to remain totally unknown to humans or else it will have to become known in a different way. Science can't say whether something exists or not, and real scientists usually don't ask that kind of question. It's generally journalists and writers of popular novels who delve into these matters based on information gathered from superficial popular science manuals. After all, it's really a matter of common sense. Science is supposed never to become complete enough to know everything about the entire universe. Isn't it clear that questions like, why does the universe exist? Why does it function as it does? Does it have any meaning? Would remain just the same. Now, our position would be quite hopeless if it weren't for one detail. There is one thing, and only one, in the entire universe about which we know more than we could learn from external observation. That thing is the human being. We do not merely observe humans from the outside. We are human beings. In this case, we have, so to speak, inside information. We know it from the inside. For this reason, we know that humans are under a moral law that was not created by them and that they cannot forget, even if they try, and to which they know they must obey. Note the following point. Anyone who studies humans from the outside, in the same way we study electricity or cabbages, without knowing our language, and consequently, without being in a position to get any inside knowledge from us, but only observing what we do, would never suspect that we have this moral law. How could they? For all that their observation would show is what we do, and the moral law is about what we ought to do. Similarly, if there were something beyond the observed facts in the case of stones or weather conditions, we, studying them from the outside, could never expect to make such a discovery. The whole question, then, is this. Do we want to know if the universe simply is what it is, with no particular reason, or if there is a power behind it that makes it what it is, since that power, if it exists, would not be of the observed facts but a reality that creates them? For no mere observation of the facts can identify it. And there's only one case that allows us to know if there's something more, namely our own case. And in this one case, we find that there is. Or we turn it inside out. If there were a controlling power outside of the universe, it could not show itself to us as one of the facts occurring inside the universe. No more than an architect of a house could actually be one of its walls, 
a staircase, or a fireplace inside the house. The only way we might expect this to reveal itself to us would be through an influence or a command prompting us to behave in a certain way. And that is precisely what we find within ourselves. Shouldn't this raise suspicions? In the one case where you can expect to get an answer, the answer is surely yes. And in the other cases where you can't get an answer, you can recognize why not. Suppose someone asked me, seeing a man in a blue uniform going down the street, leaving small cardboard packages at houses, why I suppose they contain letters. My answer would be, because whenever he leaves such a package for me, I find it contains a letter. And if he then objected, but you've never seen all these letters you think other people are getting, I would reply, of course not, and I wouldn't expect to, because they're not addressed to me. I'm explaining the packages I'm not allowed to open by those I can open. The same goes for this question. The only package I'm allowed to open is that of humanity. When I do this, especially when I open this particular human being called me, I discover that I do not exist by myself, that I am under the law, that someone or something wants me to behave in a certain way. Of course, I don't think that if I could get inside a stone or a tree, I would find exactly the same thing as I do when I examine human nature, just as I don't believe that all other people on the street receive the same letters as I do. I should expect, for example, that a stone is obliged to obey the law of gravity, that while the sender of the letters merely instructs me to obey the law of my human nature, he compels the stone to obey the laws of its stony nature. But I should expect to suppose that there is a sender in both cases, a power behind the facts, a director, a guide. Don't think I'm moving too quickly, for I haven't even come close to the God of Christian theology. All I've arrived at so far is something that is directing the universe and that appears in me as a law pushing me to do the right thing and making me feel responsible and uncomfortable when I do wrong. It seems to me we must assume that this is something more like a mind than anything else we know. Because after all, the only other thing we know is matter, and no one has ever seen a chunk of matter giving instructions. But of course, this something doesn't have to be much like a mind, much less a person. In the next chapter, we'll see if it's possible to discover anything more about this. But a word of caution here. There's been a lot of nonsense talked about God in the last hundred years. That's not what I'm offering. Forget all that. Note, to keep this part brief enough for broadcasting, I mentioned only the materialistic view and the religious view, but to complete the picture, I must mention the intermediate view called the philosophy of life force, or creative evolution, or emergent evolution, whose most cunning expositions are found in the works of Bernard Shaw, while the most profound are in the works of Bergson. People who hold this view say that the small variations by which life on this planet evolved from the lowest forms to man were not due to chance but to the aspiration or intentionality of the life force. When people say this, we must ask them to clarify whether by life force they mean something endowed with intellect or not. If there is intellect, then a mind that brings life into existence and leads it to perfection is just another name for God, and their view is thus identical to the religious one. If there is no intellect, then what sense does it make to say that something devoid of intellect aspires or has an intentionality? This seems fatal to their view. A reason why many people find creative evolution so appealing is that it gives us much of the emotional comfort of believing in God without having to take on the less pleasant consequences of it. When you're feeling cheerful, the sun is shining, and you don't want to believe that the whole universe is just a mechanical dance of atoms. It's comforting to think of this great mysterious force acting across the centuries and carrying you on its crest. If on the other hand, you wanna do something rather disreputable, the life force being just a blind, amoral, and unintellectual force will never interfere in your life in the same way that unsettling God we learned about as children will. The life force is a kind of domesticated God. You can turn it on whenever you like without it bothering you. You get all the emotions of religion and none of the costs. Is the life force the greatest work of wishful thinking the world has ever seen? We have reason to feel uneasy.
I ended the last chapter with a notion that in the moral law, someone or something beyond the material universe was really reaching out to us. And I imagine that when I reached that point, some of you felt a bit uneasy. You might even have thought that I was pulling a bait and switch. That is, I sold you what turned out to be religious talk under the guise of philosophy. You might have been prepared to listen to me as long as you believed I had nothing new to say. But if this turned out to be just religion, well, the world has already tried that, and you can't turn back the clock. If anyone is feeling this way, I would like to say three things to them. First, about turning back the clock. Would you think I was joking if I said that you can turn back the clock and that if it's showing the wrong time, it would be a very sensible thing to do? But let's put aside all this clock analogy. We all want to progress, but progress means getting nearer to where you want to be. However, if you've taken a wrong turn, then to go forward does not get you any nearer. If you're on the wrong road, progress means doing an about turn and walking back to the right road. And in that case, the man who turns back soonest is the most progressive. We've all seen this phenomenon happen in arithmetic. Whenever I start a sum wrong, the sooner I admit this, turn back, and start again, the faster I can move on. There's nothing progressive about being stubborn and refusing to admit your mistakes. And I think if you look at the current state of the world, it's very clear that humanity has made a great mistake. We're on the wrong path, and if that's true, then we must go back. That's the quickest way to move forward. Second, this isn't just religious talk. We haven't yet arrived at discussing the God of any true religion, much less the God of that particular religion called Christianity. What we've arrived at so far is merely a someone or something behind the moral law. We're not drawing from the Bible or the churches, but trying to see what we can discover about this someone on our own. And I'd like to make it clear that what we find on our own is quite shocking. We have two little clues about this someone, and one of them is the universe he created. If that were our only clue, then we might conclude that he is a great artist, for the universe is a very beautiful place, but also quite merciless and no friend to man, for the universe is a very dangerous and terrifying place. The other clue is the moral law he has put in our minds, and this is a better piece of evidence than the other because it's internal information. You'll find out more about God from the moral law than from the universe in general. Just as you'll learn more about a man by listening to his conversation than by observing a house he has built. In this sense, from the second clue, we might conclude that the being behind the universe is intensely interested in right conduct, in fair play, altruism, courage, good faith, honesty, and truthfulness. In this sense, we must agree with Christianity and some other religions that God is good. But let's not rush ahead. The moral law doesn't give us any reason to think that God is good in the sense of being indulgent or soft or compassionate. There's nothing soft about the moral law. It's relentless. It tells you what has to be done, period, without caring how painful or dangerous or difficult it might be. If God is like the moral law, then he is not indulgent. It's no use at this point claiming what you mean by a God. Good is a God who can forgive. You're moving too quickly. Only a person can forgive, and we haven't yet reached a personal God, just a power behind the moral law that is more like a mind than anything else. But he could still be very different from a person. If it's a purely impersonal mind, there might be no sense in asking it to make allowances for you or to turn a blind eye, just as it makes no sense to ask the multiplication table to turn a blind eye when you got your sums wrong. Anyway, you might get the wrong result. Nor does it help to say that if there's a God of this kind, an impersonal and absolute goodness, then you don't like him and won't care about him. Because the problem is that part of you is on his side and actually agrees with his disapproval of greed, deceit, and human exploitation. You may want him to make an exception in your case to let it slide just this once, but deep down you know that the power behind the real world must detest this kind of behavior, because otherwise he couldn't be good. On the other hand, we know that if there is an absolute goodness, it must hate most of the things we do. This is the fix we are in. If the universe is not governed by an absolute goodness, then all our efforts are in the long run hopeless. But if it is, then we are making ourselves enemies of that goodness every day, and we have no chance of doing better tomorrow. And so once again, our case is hopeless. We are lost with or without it.
God is our only comfort, but also the supreme terror, the thing we most need and the thing we most want to hide from. He is our only possible ally, and we have made ourselves his enemies. To some people, the idea of coming face to face with absolute goodness sounds amusing. They need to think again. They're merely playing at religion. Either goodness is our greatest security or our greatest danger, depending on how you react to it. And we've reacted about as wrongly as we possibly could. Let's go to my third point. When I chose to get to where I wanted by these roundabouts, I wasn't trying to trick you. I had another reason. My reason for this is that Christianity simply doesn't make sense until you face the kind of facts I've described. Christianity tells people they ought to repent and promises them forgiveness. So it has nothing to say, as far as I know, to those who think they need nothing to repent of and don't feel they need forgiveness. It's only after you realize there's a real moral law and a power behind that law and that you've broken that law and put yourself wrong with that power. It's only after all this and not a moment sooner that Christianity begins to talk your language. When you know you're sick, you'll listen to the doctor. When you realize our situation is hopeless, you'll begin to understand what Christians are talking about. They tell you how we got into our present state of both hating and loving goodness, as well as how God can be that impersonal mind behind the moral law, and yet at the same time a person. They tell you how the demands of this law, which neither you nor I can meet, have been met on our behalf, how God himself became a human being to save humanity from God's disapproval. That's an old story. And if you're going to look into it, no doubt you'll consult people who have more authority to speak on it than I have. All I'm doing is asking people to face the facts, to understand the issues Christianity claims to answer, because those facts are quite grim. I wish I could say something more agreeable, but I must say what I think is true. Of course, I agree that the Christian religion is, in the long run, a thing of unspeakable comfort. But it does not begin in comfort, but with the dismay I have been describing. And it's no use trying to get the comfort without first going through the dismay. In religion, as in war and everything else, comfort is the one thing you cannot get by looking for it directly. If you look for truth, you may find comfort in the end. If you look for comfort, you will not get either comfort or truth. Only soft soap and wishful thinking to begin, and in the end, despair. Most of us have given up pre-war illusions about international politics. It's time we did the same about religion, 